We're about 90 miles from Cuba and at the southernmost point in the continental United States. Where are we? Okay, one more hint. People born here are nicknamed Cox. For those who couldn't guess it, we are in Key West, Florida. Now, without further ado, here are my top 10 things to do in Key West. At number 10, I've got Cuban Coffee Queen. Look, since you're so darn close to Cuba, make sure to find a good cup of Cuban coffee. After some research online, Cuban Coffee Queen had some rave reviews and I was not disappointed. I actually loved it so much I returned two days in a row and had it one day with their sugar and then the other day without. Both were yummy and gave me the energy boost I was in desperate need for. Always different. Oh, that's different. Make sure to go early since they are not open late. And oh, they've got two locations in Key West, so find what's convenient for you. Cheers. At number nine, we've got Smathers Beach. Smathers Beach covers a lot of real estate. I did come after the hurricane and understandably the water was gray and murky, but warm. But I can see how it could be beautiful in certain optimal weather conditions if it doesn't get hit by smelly seaweed. There was one food truck serving beverages and snacks. Not many food options here. You'll also find other vendors here offering beach chairs and water activity equipment for rent. An enjoyable couple of hours were spent here. The Little White House is what I got for number eight. It was a very uneventful visit, but it was fun cruising around the neighborhood where a former president used to live. It is said on their website that President Truman spent a total of 11 working vacations in Key West during his presidency and returned five more times after his presidency. Uneventful, but educational. Uh, you could choose to pay money to go inside for a more in-depth tour. I just roamed around the gorgeous gardens for free and then left. There's also a shop inside to purchase presidential memorabilia should you be feeling patriotic on this day of your visit. At number seven, I've got, quote, the seafood did not disappoint, end quote, sincerely a seafood snob. Boathouse had an amazing happy hour for small plates and it was right on the pier. Phenomenal selection, by the way. Beer battered shrimp. Whoever made this batter and selected the shrimp deserves an award. It's like perfectly crispy and juicy at the same time and the shrimp tastes phenomenal. I also went to Alonso two days in a row. I got their seafood tower and other raw random dishes. Epic spot for a post scuba dive snack. I don't remember eating any entrees because I was so impressed by their raw selection. It was tough to pick my favorite seafood item, but if I had a gun to my head, the lobster roll I had on Duval Street was hey. epic and has been carved into my taste buds forever. A complete winner. The taste, freshness, juiciness, and how darn soft this lobster roll was makes it very hard to forget. Number six, have a key lime pie. You'll see a thousand shop signs and billboards with the word key lime this, key lime that. It's a vibe here. I've had hundreds of key lime pies in my lifetime, but I've noticed that as I've gotten older, I've gotten more particular. That being said, to date, the best key lime pie I have ever had was here at Moondog Cafe. So it's just a traditional like grip whip meringue, but what okay. they do is they add a key lime zest to it. So what they do is they'll batch up the, the meringue with uh -huh. a, kind of like a whip type ordeal, okay. add the key lime zest to it, and then uh, yeah, then what they do is they grab a torch and then they slowly torch it right there. And all of those flavors combined, I mean, it gives a, like a crisp to it, it gives a sweet like uh, punch to it. And since I was on a key lime pie roll, I had to try another variety for a different perspective. So I went for the chocolate dipped key lime pie on a stick on Duval Street. The pie at Moondog Cafe was the easy winner. At number five, I don't have a point of interest. I have a request. And that request is to snorkel or dive. Do one of the two. Because Key West, Florida is home to the only living barrier reef in the continental United States. I mean, how cool is that? The Florida reef is found about six to seven miles offshore of Key West. There are a number of companies that will take you snorkeling or diving and they'll have morning or afternoon trips. Just make sure to kind of book ahead because things can fill up pretty fast. 
But yeah, back to where I started, be sure to snorkel or dive. If you don't know how to dive, get certified, then dive. I came to Key West to get my advanced certification and I have zero buyer's remorse here. I went with Captain's Corner and my dive instructor was knowledgeable and passionate about his work. And I got to see tons of marine life as well as the shipwreck in a very short amount of time. At number four, I've got Duval Street. It's fun in the day, but it comes to life at night. Duval Street is the main street of downtown and is home to a vibrant collection of hole-in-the-wall bars, historic haunts, funky shops, galleries, and outdoor cafes. The street runs north and south from the Gulf of Mexico to the Atlantic Ocean. Although it is not much more than a mile in length, this is where the heartbeat of the city comes to life with a diverse array of shops, attractions, and over 200 bars and restaurants. So come on down, feast up, do a historic or ghost tour, attend a drag show, do a bar crawl, or just walk around. Remember, parking is tough, so Uber or ride a bike or walk here and wear comfortable shoes because you will probably find something to do. At number three, I've got the Ernest Hemingway Home and Museum. The address is 907 Whitehead Street, Key West, Florida. His house is cool, but the six-toed cats were the star of the show easily. But first, a little background. The Ernest Hemingway house was the residence of the legendary American writer Ernest Hemingway in the 1930s. Hemingway and his wife restored the decaying property and made several additions such as a swimming pool and a fountain made out of a urinal. True story. During his time at this home, Hemingway wrote some of his best received works. Fun fact, another one. There is a penny stuck to the concrete in the patio area. Hemingway put it there after saying that the project cost him every last penny he had. Funny guy. The admission, which includes a free guided tour, is $17 for adults and $7 for children ages 6 to 12. Kids 5 and under are free. The home slash museum is also famous for its large population of the so-called Hemingway cats. Many of them are polydactyl, which means six-toed cats. I am now in a land where the cats have extra toes. And no, this is not the only one that has this special feature. And the Hemingway home has about 60 of these cats. It's rather cute and it looks as though they're wearing mittens because they appear to have a thumb on their paw. It is said that Hemingway was given a white six-toed cat by a ship's captain and some of the cats who live on the museum grounds are descendants of that original cat named Snow White. You could easily spend a couple of hours here in a very casual and small setting. I saw people sit and read a book in the gardens watching the sun reflect off the iconic pool, all while looking for cats. At number two, we've got Sunset at Mallory Square. The Sunset Celebration is a nightly arts festival at Mallory Square, where hundreds come every night to mark the passing of yet another day in paradise. It's recommended you arrive two hours prior to the official sunset. Now, the cruise ships do dock right next door, but since 1984, they have been required to leave port at least for two hours prior to the sunset, and then they could return afterwards. This leads to an even more stunning view of the golden ball sinking down into the horizon. The nightly festival brings in visitors from all over the world who come to enjoy performances by magicians, jugglers, clowns, psychics, and local musicians. But that's not the best part about the sunset at Mallory Square. The best part is actually the colors of the sunset itself. It's different in another worldly sort of way. I've seen the sunset here twice in my life and it was just as magical the second time as it was the first. And finally, at number one, we have Fort Taylor Beach and Park. This one is a double whammy because it is a two-in-one. Not only does this park boast of the best beach in Key West, it's also a Civil War era fort. Numerous hours were spent here. The park's entrance fee was quite nominal, like two to three bucks a person. So worth it. First, let's talk about the fort. 
Walking inside the fort and through the brick archways will take you back in time and you can't help but wonder what life was like for the soldiers that had to man the cannons and keep a weather eye on the horizon. The historic state park has the largest collection of Civil War armaments in the United States. They have some amazing cannons. If you're lucky, you might even encounter some actors reenacting the Civil War era out on the field. Now who said Key West doesn't have nice beaches? Fort Zach Taylor Beach was beautiful. It is said that the beach is at the point where the Atlantic Ocean meets the Gulf of Mexico. This is Key West's best beach with clearer water, good snorkeling, a shaded picnic area, and a snack bar in the near vicinity. Tip number one, bring water shoes. It's rocky, but the water is incredible. Tip number two, the park stays open through sunset every night and visitors who are in the know will keep their admission receipt and come back at dusk to watch the sun drop in the water. Well, there you have it. That's my top 10. I did not rent a car, so I didn't venture out too far. Every point of interest mentioned here is within bicycling distance. Your list might be different than mine, and if I skipped anything, please put it in the comments. Maybe it'll help someone who's planning a trip to Key West. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you watching. Until next time, ciao.